Good morning, everyone. Good morning, beautiful people. Bye. My name is Alicia Phillips. I am the Portsmouth Campus Student Center Associate Director, and I'm representing the Virtual Student Center. The Student Center is at um, Tidewater Community College on all four of the campuses. Um, today, we are collaborating with Professor Brash's um, English 111 class. Um, where we are doing academic writing. And we're really excited to just spend some time learning more about academic writing from the students in her class. But as she mentioned, because August is American Artist Appreciation, Appreciation Month, we are looking at all forms of art. So that would include visual, graphic, dance, as she mentioned, theater, um, any form of art that you might be interested in or engaged in that you would like to share with us after we uh, hear some of the academic writing from her English 111 class. Mm -hmm. Today, we are fe featuring Star Hilton, who is one of your classmates as the host of this event. And in a moment, I'm gonna give her the floor. Um, we have some Brave Space Decorum that she will go over with you and give you the opportunity to add any points that you would like to see listed that will support you in being your best self, bringing yourself to the fore, um, stretching yourself a little bit in a space where you feel safe to do so. This is in being at Tidewater Community College, think of the space as being um, an incubator, supporting you and developing yourself um, in various ways not just the, your, the way that you are conceiving um, or perceiving uh, for your career. Um, we also have an, another professor here with us, Dr. Sharon Waters. Um, she doesn't have her camera on and maybe she will put her camera on and introduce herself to you a little later, but I wanted to let you know that she <laughs> is in the space. Thank you so much, uh, Alicia, for inviting me because I teach uh, principles of public speaking I've been teaching it for years, and I agree with you so much, Professor Brash, about uh, different types of art forms. Because you know, most of my students, when they come in, like, oh, I don't want to give a speech. They can sing it, they can dance it, whatever. Nice. It's, it's, it's their expression. So I'm looking forward to it. I hope you don't mind me just turning off and you know, turning off my face. But I want to say hi and thank you again. So, well, thank so, you, Dr. Waters, for being okay. with us. Okay. Star, I'm going to give you the floor. Welcome, class. Uh, <laughs> I am, I was selected host <laughs> on a, <laughs> kind of uh, on a spot, I guess, because of my pretty face. But um, I want y'all to understand that this is an opportunity for us to get credit. <laughs> okay, I don't, if you, now I'm going to tell you this, I've, um, I've never shared anything, any type of my writings to more than 20 people at one time. I've always had to, you know, tell one person on this side and tell one person on this side. If I feel like I want, if I could trust you with it, I will share it with you. Um, at this time, you know, space, I feel like I can um, encourage um, not only myself, but my peers as well to come forward and um, some of the writing, and I say Ms. Brash did one good job um, teaching us this summer as far as trying to get our grammar right and, you know, how to form our writings together, whether you are creative, um, a creative writer or not. Um, but she definitely helped me. <laughs> I will say that. Um, if you want to go forth with yours, um, you know, just put your hand up. I can be able to, you know, shout you out and you can go on next if you feel like you want to. Um, if um, if you want to, um, you know, you can do like this if you really, you know, a little support from anybody. It don't matter who it is. Um, great work is great work. Um, and just being, uh, just being open and be able to share is a big step for a lot of us. Um, so if anyone would like to go first, um, and let me know if y'all want me to go first, and I can just say yeah. And I'm so good. sorry, we have the Brave, um, Brave Space Decorum, um, notes in the chat, and we can read those, and then of course we can go around if anyone has any other points that they like to make sure that we pay, we tend to during this time that we're together, um, we can add those. And then Star, I think you're the star. I think you should be going first. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, you said exactly what you wanted me to. So um, it says in the chat, brave space decorum, and I can repost it. Um, please remove all background distract distractions. So I think that Professor Brash has has that as a general rule in her class um, to remove background distractions. Um, listen with an open heart and open mind. Um, one person at a time, please. Um, provide encouragement in the chat box audibly when appropriate, when there's time for you to, you know, if you know, share something that uh, you like to share that's encouraging, you can do so audibly. And reserve any criticism, negative criticism, and any judgment, and offer constructive criticism and advice when asked. Um, and then we can continue. Are there other um, points that people want to want us to think about as we are moving forward so that you feel safe um, to share, Dr. Uh, Professor Brash? Uh, I would just say that um, keep in mind, this is, we're not doing peer editing. This is not a writer's workshop. We're not trying to workshop these pieces at all. So, you know, this is not, not trying to get people to make suggestions about, I think you should, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, this is just an opportunity to present your work and just to kind of just put it out there, just release it into the world and, you know, get some, get some, some nice pats on the back, maybe from your peers. And, um, you know, when you do those types of activities, and I'm sure Dr. Waters would, you know, would also feel strongly this way, and Alicia too, that, that when you you know, the first time you do something, it can be very intimidating and you can be very stressed about it. And I remember I used to hyperventilate when I had to, I mean, I'll run my mouth forever sitting in a desk, but when I used to have to get up in front of my class as a student, I would literally hyperventilate. But once you start doing it, it gets easier. Each time it's easier. And so I think that this is also potentially a life skill and a, and a job skill if you guys get used to kind of putting your own personal stuff out there, putting your own writing, your own work, your own creativity out there, it gets a little bit easier each time. It's definitely a, a community building space. And oftentimes um, at a community college, um, folks forget that the point of a, an environment, a higher education environment is to allow yourself to develop and grow, explore, um, and you know, develop those skills. Um, that is needed as a civic, as someone that was going to be involved civically in the greater society. Um, you know, giving part of yourself, exercising that, those aspects of yourself, your self-expression, your thoughts, your ideas is actually obligatory. I mean, you don't come into this world with this stuff to keep it to yourself. This, what you have no one else has. And that when you sharing it helps to make the world a better place. That's important. So you, we want to make sure that you have that space where you can exercise that and develop that muscle. So then when you do go into the world and every, and not everyone is so nice, you are, you have a strong back and a soft heart. I want to say, um, since I was um, able to exercise that this type of writing, um, I did take, um, or I, said, I did take a like an idea from the story that she told us about um, Henry, the uh, the first essay that we was introduced to. Um, I kind of love. No, I, I don't kind of. I actually love that essay to the point where it speaks so many volumes on so many levels, especially for um, you know African American community. It actually speaks so many volumes and. I shared it on Facebook. I went everywhere with it. And you said, I said, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to see if I can put it in Star Wars. So it was my first time actually exercising something that, you know, I have, like, like I said, I haven't wrote in a long time. So I'm going to read it. It is called I Ain't Done Nothing. Um, it came from the book Push. I'm not sure if. A lot of you um, heard that um, that book by Sapphire, but it's really a good book. Um, it was presented in a movie called Precious. Um, I guess you can say um, I took my life and tried to flip it. So 
hopefully um, I get good snaps for this one. But <laughs> um, I'm thinking about publishing it, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, so it's called I Ain't Done Nothing. Um, I will start. It was the winner of 1982 in Charleston, South Carolina. Young Darlene had recently lost her favorite uncle. Come on, Darlene. I said, no child, said the father to his 12-year-old daughter. But why, daddy? Her uncle Henry would have, my uncle Henry would have wanted me to have some of his things. She wept. Nonsense, gal. I do not want you around Henry's mess. I ain't no telling what his buzz been on. But we have a picture of him at home. You can remember him that way, he said to her. Darlene could no longer hold her feelings about her uncle inside. At the time, she could only remember why her father would oppose her taking some of her uncle's possessions. Flash forward to, flash forward to the 95 degree hot weather in the summer of 2000 in the Bronx, New York. Yeah, I was a shy little girl eight years old on the block of Townsend and Jerome Avenue. This is off the main street called the Grand Concourse where my grandfather lived. The subway was less than a mile away from where we stood. The vibrations from the train mixed with the bass of the music caused our feet to vibrate from the grounds beneath us. It was the music melody and the smell of delicious food that led people to come and have a great time. It was a block party. So many people and kids were out. There were tall, short, skinny, and different type of peoples and shades of brown. Chairs and barbecue grills were everywhere. If you did not have a chair, you were standing, you either standing up laughing or dancing on the pavement. Kids were running around wild and crossing the street without looking. Parked cars were lined up so closely together on each side of the street that it was so hard to walk between them. We were all relieved there were no cars coming to interrupt our gets together. My grandfather's stepniece lived in the lived in a um, brick building, solid a brick solid building where partying in front of. I remember seeing my step cousins playing with kids I never knew before. I I loved the feeling of of being around new people. It made me feel normal and happy. The kids were the, the kids decided to go upstairs. I'm sorry, to my step cousin's apartment. I mean, I remember asking my mother for permission to go upstairs. I just followed the kids inside. Once we were upstairs, they went wild. They started doing cartwheels in the living room, playing their own music to the, and to dance to. And one of my step cousins asked me why was I so shy. I found that offensive. Although I was a little shy. It was more so I was scared. Actually, I was terrified that I was going to get in trouble. My mother will always found a way to ruin my party simply by not liking something she could not control. Being that I was the first child at the time, she stayed alert. She knew who, what, when, and why. I remember a brown-skinned girl with lots of hair in the room. She was tall with a smile so bright as the sun when she spoke, her voice had calm, mellow volume to it. It was soft as a baby's bottom. I thought she was pretty and a little too old to be upstairs with us. Her kind eyes around, um, looked around the room with curiosity. I did not know the girl's name. However, I knew both of our moms went to high school together. The girl had two siblings with her my age, so I guess that she was the oldest. We all started dancing to Destiny's Child, Jump and Jump. I did not know the words, <laughs> but I was a good dancer. After dancing to our own music upstairs, we began to play freeze tag in the building's hallway. The building smelled like fresh white paint that was put on walls the same week. The cream colored walls were followed by the cream colored staircase that was recently painted as well. Painted olive green, olive elevator, sorry, stood directly across from the staircase. The hallway looked like heaven. The brown-skinned girl with pretty hair, she flew right past us, out the door, running to the end of the hall, daring anyone's race. We played freeze tag until our stomachs cried for food again. 
I did not want to go back downstairs because I was having such a good time with the kids. We all headed downstairs to see what the adults were talking about and what they were doing. To my surprise, I saw my mom dancing. She was happy. We were finally having fun together in the same atmosphere other than home. I could not help but to dance with my mother after eating my delicious burnt hot dog. The burnt hot dog sat in my soft warm bun with drizzled apple red ketchup, golden yellow spicy mustard, and an off-white sauerkraut. This was the first time I smelled and tasted freedom. I pushed for this moment. I pushed to feel normal with my mom around new people. I have never seen her party like this before. She wore a sign on her floor that read, no worries. At the, at the moment, nothing mattered. The fact that I was the child of a, of a single mother who stood firm and protecting me at all times did not register. Growing up, being told to stay out of grown folks' business was an anthem. It just seemed that grown folks had the best entertainment any kid can ask for. I was part of grown folks now. When a song changed, I asked my mom, can I go back upstairs? She said, no. But mom, why not? I just want to go play freeze tag again. I wept. I felt my eyes starting to water. I could not hold back the tears. I wish that were not there. I was positive that the other kids called me waterhead, but I didn't care. Listen, I said no, she replied. I felt my eyes burning, so I, I wiped my face with my T-shirt. That was it. That was the last push. I wiped my tears, and I, I, I helped cleaned up, and I, I felt alone again. We ended up leaving 20 minutes after. We did not live far, so the walk home seemed longer because of the silence. When we finally arrived home, she opened the door, and I walked in from behind her without making a peek. The smell of fried chicken passed my nose as I walked in. I forgot that she prepared food for the block party that, that early that day. Oh, hungry again. I took my shoes off and I started walking towards the bathroom to take a shower. She stopped me and told me to sit at the wooden dining room table. The circle pattern on the table had different shades of brown as if it was cut right from the tree trunk. You couldn't tell the tree aged through the generations. When I sat, I rubbed the table, admiring its history. My mother's face looked different. She looked as if she did not want to say anything, but had no choice. The sounds from the neighbors upstairs were loud enough to break the silence in the bedroom, one bedroom apartment. You know that tall girl with the pretty hair? She asked. I say yes. I, I, asked, I answered confusedly. I did not know where she was going with this. She has AIDS slash HIV, my mother said. I froze. I instantly felt sad for the girl. I had no idea that she was battling with something so awful as healthy as she could. At the time, I did not think that was even possible. Although I still wanted my freedom, I pushed hard to prove to my mother that I am responsible for making my own decisions. The girl and I had fun. Regardless of the circumstances, I could not have treated her any different if I knew. I just did not understand why my mom started to cry. My uncle died of AIDS when I was 12 years old. At the time, I could not understand why my father kept me away from him in the end. Now that I have my own child, I understand. My mother said, but Ma, you can't treat her like a monster. <laughs> I said, I don't think I'm treating her like a monster. I just don't want you catching it. I just worry about it, that's all. We heard a knock at the door. My mom asked, who is it? The person replied, Darlene, open the door. It's me, Mary. That's it. That is actually a true story. Um, I did not make it up. A great uncle did out of AIDS. I didn't get a chance to meet him. Uh, my mother was very devastated. That's probably the first, um, the first heartbreak that she's ever gotten at a young age for her to, uh, to, to witness something so horrible at a young age. And it happened to a loved one at that. Um, and I'm just a kid, you know, I'm just trying to have fun and, 
you know, I'm always under my mom wing, especially in New York City. You know, I'm always, always under her. I was always only around my cousins and my family. I never got the chance to be out with other people. That was my first time being out with other people. And to experience that at a young age kind of messed me up. And that's what made me start writing. That's when I started writing poetry. When I was able to put myself in that girl's shoes, I was able to write after. I wrote a poem for her called um, 13 Years Old. That she was 13 to my cousin. And um, she got it from a guy who he was trying to be grown, of course. Um, got it from a guy who she thought, somebody around 15, who's close to her age. I don't know how he, you know, it's just things happen, life happens. Nobody really knows. For me to experience that, and that's why I use Precious Story, if you know it. I try to line it up with it as much as I can and try to say like AIDS is a monster, the disease, not the people. And that's how it's always treated. So I kind of do want to go public with it um, if you kind of know that ground up. But it was a great piece. Um, ooh, so does anybody else want to go ask? <laughs> All right, so um, this is one of the essays that I made during class. It's um, titled My Best Friend and I. Um, once in a lifetime, there's a special someone we who can always be counted on to have our back, someone who can return to you when we are sad. The special person is called a best friend, someone who, no matter what happens, will stick with you until the end. A best friend is someone who can do all this and so much more, which is why I decided to write about Simon Page, my 19-year-old best friend. My friend Simon is constantly known for his light skin, dark curly hair, and green eyes. At first, he looked he may be tall and a bit talkative, but once you get to know him, you realize he made a lifelong friend. Not only does he have a skinny and lanky bill, but when it comes to interacting with people, he's a non-people person. This is backed up by the fact that he can always be seen interacting with new people. When it comes to the meaning of a friend, there's no one better suited for that word than Simon. Friends usually come and go, but when it comes to word loyalty, you can see my friend Simon as someone who will stick by you no matter what. Our friendship started back in fourth grade, and has been going strong ever since. Even though we aren't able to hang out as much due to COVID, our bond is still sturdy. Every time we would come over to hang out, it was sure to be a good time. Playing video games, eating pizza, and just doing little things friends would do never got old for us, no matter how old we are. When playing video games or playing sports, he could be a bit of a brother whenever he would win. Funny enough, just like most long-time friends, we had a lot in common which to the point where it was common to confuse us as brothers. Our common interests helped shape our friendship into the same bond it is today. So, so, some of the things that made our bond so close include being from two heavily religious families, sharing an interest in video games and TV shows, and having the same hobbies. This also included our shared love of sports, especially football and basketball. Even though my friend was known for being athletic, he also had a bit of a stereotypical and ugly look to him. Wearing glasses and being riddled with freckles was another trait we shared. Um, <coughs> however, beyond that, my friend was also well fashion and had a personal look to him at times. This will also help him when it came to opening up to new people. My friend was also cheerful and small a lot in addition to his charms. When standing up, he was also often seen as a giant and was capable of making anyone look like an ant when compared to you. We often like to compare our friendship to likes of Frodo and Sam, Han Solo and Chewbacca, George and Lenny, and etc. Of course, while we also had different tastes with certain things, we were still close as friends. 
the bond with my friend has gotten stronger over the years, even to the point where we sometimes refer to each other as brothers from a different mother. Even when we get into an argument at times, someone is still able to be understanding of different people's opinions. He's the type when someone is sad, knows how to cheer them up and make them laugh or brighten their day out, sometimes to, ex- to his expense. He's also a type of person to give words of encouragement to people that need it most, no matter who that person might be. Even when he might not understand what he is, someone he's trying to say, someone who's perfectly capable of understanding anything you say without getting upset or angry. If you ever need a friend that is in any shape, way, or form, similar to Simon, make sure to treasure them as long as you can, because only then will you realize what the training of a friend is, and that's all I have. Uh, my name is Alma Kelly. Uh, as you know, English is not my first language, so pardon me if I don't speak like you all, okay? Um, I am a student at Tidewater Community College, and I'm going to write uh, memories of my childhood, which I think I personally think I'm one of the children in the whole world that had a great childhood. I mean, it's not based on money, but in love, like from grandparents and parents and a father. So anyhow, I'm going to start, um, the name of my memories uh, paper is Memories of My Father and Me. When I was five years old, I lived in a city by the name of San Miguel near the Pacific Ocean in El Salvador, Central America. I remember my father and I used to go to the downtown of the city where we lived at the time. It took us 45 minutes to arrive in downtown and we went every Saturday. We drove in his Jeep to get there. We stayed all day long eating in cafes and shopping. I was just having quality time with my father. My father has he had his routines that rarely varied. It included going to a soup restaurant to get the dry soup, which I hated at the time. Then he will go to a seamstress where he will have all his clothes made. I was bored and complained a lot because I was just wanted my treat toy. He will tell me, hatch up, Almita. Despite my complaining, I really looked forward to the special times with my father. Let me recollect one particular day. As soon as we arrived in downtown, we visited the cathedral. And after lighting a candle, we prayed together for 15 minutes and then left. My father geared up his Jeep and we headed to the farmer's market, a place where they sold fruits and vegetables to eat tripe soup. As a child, I hated tripe soup made of the cow intestines and parts of the cow it had a bad smell. <laughs> it was disgusting to me. My father asked, they waited for his tripe soup and I started to get terrible upset to the point that I started crying and crying while my father was eating his soup and enjoying it. <laughs> I do not think that he wanted to hear my crying and he responded to me by saying, Almita, stop crying. You will not get your way. I stopped and he told me, I will take you to your favorite cafe when I finish eating my soup. Finally, we finished and we headed to my favorite cafe where they have the best sandwiches milkshakes and banana splits, which we will get soon after we finish, we will begin running errands. I remember going to the hat store where my father used to buy hats all the time. 
Another place we went was to the seamstress shop where they measured him as he ordered a suit. Overseas, people did not have to be rich to have their clothes made because there were no retail clothing stores at that time. Everyone, rich or poor, had their clothes tailor-made for them. To have a seamstress, a seamstress was normal. They made clothes all the time for customers. That is how it was done. The last place we went was the toy store where I picked one or two toys, like a doll or a game. As a child, I liked games. After all of this, it was the end of the day and we jumped back in the Jeep and headed to home. This was the particular day, but there were many more like them. These were the good times and memories that I have about my father and how we spent it together as a father and daughter. I will remember these memories and always cherish them. Some parents never <clears throat> have time for their children. My father took all the time and every Saturday to be with me, his first and oldest child. As an adult now, I do like tripe soup. I only eat it once a year <laughs> because it has lots of cholesterol. Eating my father's favorite dish is a way to remember our happy times together when I was a girl. Sadly, my father passed away in 1993 in El Salvador. I will always remember him as a good father in his own way and treasure the memories. My father was killed by intruders that robbed his and murdered him in his home. I suspect his death was due to the usual home invasions that were common at the time in El Salvador. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful piece. Very beautiful. The next person on the list. Jada West. My name is Jada. Um, I also attend TCC. <laughs> I wrote a, um, it was a narrative essay called The First Race with My Dad. I have always believed that the journey is more than the destination. Although the ability to achieve your goal is something worth celebrating, I think being able to say you tried and did the best you could is very much something to be proud of. It takes a lot of encouragement to begin a goal and finish it. I believe doing the best you can is all that really matters. When I ran my first race, I was more into the idea of doing it for fun and not necessarily for the competition. I began watching marathons when I was about 10 or 11 years old. My dad had run his first marathon with my uncle in Virginia Beach. This became one of the most exciting memories in my life. As a child, I had always loved to run because I was very active and had lots of energy. Running and racing with my friends was one of my favorite activities to do outside after school. If I were not running, I was usually cheering or dancing. The day of my dad's marathon, we woke up very early to get on the road and arrived in Virginia Beach around seven in the morning. It was a little cold and lightly foggy outside. There was a huge crowd of people waiting to watch the race. And there was a crowd of runners getting ready to run soon, my dad and uncle included. After everyone stood still for the Star Spangled Banner, they started to count down for the race and the runners got into their start positions. My mom, sister, and I stood tall watching as the runners took off past the start line. And everyone watching cheered with so much excitement and energy. I was only about 10 years old, but I knew immediately that this was something I would like to do someday. My dad had inspired me so much that day, and he had made us all proud. I have always looked up to my parents because everything they have, they have worked hard for, and I'm now following in their footsteps. 
Seeing my dad and uncle cross the finish line together with big smiles on their faces made me so happy. They did not make first place or second place, but that did not matter to them because they still had fun. My uncle told my dad about an upcoming 5K run and asked if he wanted to run again. When I heard about it, I insisted on running with them. We all decided to start training the very next week on Monday. Monday morning, we went to my uncle's house and started training. We had two months to train and prepare for the race. We stretched first and did little obstacles involving running or jogging. There was one day that we were training and in the middle of running when I had almost passed out, I was dehydrated and had not eaten breakfast that morning before we trained. It was the worst feeling ever because my vision became very blurry and it started to sound like my hearing was slightly moving further away. I had to sit down and take a break while I drank lots of water and ate crackers until I felt fine again. After that day, I never skipped breakfast again and I was prepared for each morning. The week had finally come and our big day was just a few days away. To practice the whole week, we decided to take things easy and focus more on our pacing. We were not worried about what number we would place because we were doing the race to stay active in a fun way. When the big day arrived, I was so excited because I could not believe I was finally doing this. All of the runners had their numbers attached to them and waited while the Star Spangled Banner played. We all stood patiently and silently until the national anthem was performed. We reached the starting line and stood in position while the countdown began. And then we all took off at once. My dad, uncle, and I started the race with a slow and steady pace and a steady breathing technique. I had so much adrenaline running in me that I was not worried about getting tired. We ran down a street, up in road, and also through a neighborhood. There was people standing outside of their homes and at the end of the street cheering us on. Seeing all of those people cheer for us made me feel proud and it motivated me even more. We hit the finish line all at the same time, feeling relieved and happy. We had finally gotten through the race after so much training and all of the hard work we put in. Passing the finish line was a great accomplishment, but even starting the race was an accomplishment itself. We were not in the first few places, but we still won because we tried and did not give up. We left with our medals and celebrated afterwards. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. So you need a you need a saying like a family that runs together or something. I mean, like I, together. <laughs> yeah, I think it's so nice. I think it's so cool that you that you first of all that the runners are running together mm -hmm. and just loving it, like you know, crossing the finish line with a smile, and also that the family members who aren't running are there, you know, cheering. Cheering and, too. You know, yep. Yeah. So it's like a whole family activity. I love it. It was it was so much fun. <laughs> It sounds like that's when you had a nice time with your family the most. It sounds mm -hmm. like that's what you really you even took yourself serious. <laughs> you ate. <laughs> you ate the made breakfast every day. You didn't skip it after that. That's you know, that's yeah. that dedication. <laughs> <laughs> so do you still run today? Um, yes, a little bit. That actually is a marathon coming up. Um, I'm hoping to do the full thing this time with my dad and my uncle. So I'm waiting to hear back on that. And I'll do it. So <laughs> trying to get my sister and mom to join this time. <laughs> that would be pretty dope. That would be really <laughs> nice. For the whole family to be out there, that would be nice. What's been amazing for me listening um, is feeling the emotion from each of you um, as you read. Um, the, the spirit of the piece is coming out in your your face, your facial expressions, the energy that's coming from your bodies is really amazing. Now, who's gonna be, who's gonna volunteer on the spot? Do we have any, you know, people who might, now that they've seen how it goes, might be willing to share their pieces? And I know we, we're still coming back to Star for at least one poem as well. So it doesn't have to be an essay, 
It can be art, it can be poetry, it can be music, what you got. I'm gonna call Marco out. Marco, you ain't got nothing. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Yay. Hey, Marco! <laughs> I knew it was coming, too. I knew it was coming. I had to do it. <laughs> come on, man, I told you, hey, come on, you're a good writer. I know. Definitely. How do you know that? No one told you that. All right. <laughs> this is a. Uh, I was, my name is Marco Brown. I go to CCC. I'm on Virginia Beach. And. This piece is from my time in Afghanistan two years ago. Yeah, two years ago today, I would have been there. Uh, it would have been a month before the incident that I wrote about. And hmm, not really any other backstory other than I was a forensic technician working in Afghanistan. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very intense. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> it gets pretty graphic. But it happened and you gotta live with it. So the title of this essay is, it's a narrative, is am I supposed to just ignore the presence of body parts on my screen as I type this report, sir? Now, am I clear, by the way? Can y'all hear me? Too? Sounds great. That's me. Okay. Let's begin. I had always thought that I can never happen, that it can never happen to me or even around me for that matter. I worked in a secure concrete room with a 90 pound door and my immediate protection being my rifle slash pistol combination. In forensic school, I felt the whole fingerprint extracting, DNA swabbing and material identifying were almost like magical powers. I used over a half a million dollars worth of equipment to find the smallest details that fit into a big picture and called it evidence. With that, I was very good at my job and a Taliban took notice of this when their bomb makers and key leaders started disappearing from the planet. It had been only a short four months for me in Afghanistan before B-Day, bomb day, suddenly happened. Afghanistan was hot, dry, had coarse air, and did not necessarily want us, the U.S. military, on their soil. I had been in there playing NCIS for four months and getting bad people killed and bad leaders called by our and the Afghan security forces. I was proud of that, but for once, I was getting tired of doing it. Once in the lab, I turned on a laptop we aggressively acquired from a terrorist a few days prior and began pursuing the contents of the media section with my music playing on my Bluetooth speaker from my phone. I was skimming through, through the pictures and videos on, my, on the laptop while saying goodnight, I love you to my girlfriend back in the States on my phone when I got the knock at the door. My girlfriend had no idea that the love of her life was about to change internally for the rest of his life and that she'd be looking at someone new when she came home, when I came home. Both explosive ordnance disposal guys entered the room and placed a one single bomb switch on the intake table. I took my overview shots with the device and headed over to my computer to insert the memory card. I turned around and noticed that the lead EOD guy, who shall not be named, had picked up the pressure plate and began disassembly in a typical fashion. I was completely okay with this because after all, all three of us had gone through, the, gone through and graduated from the same forensic school. I noticed they had their cool little thing they do as EOD guys, which is move their expensive sunglasses down over their eyes, even when handling inert items. I looked at them carefully, began to manipulate the tube on a pressure plate for extraction, and started to think to myself, I wonder if I should, boom. It was like the flash of a picture, except when the flash went away, all I could see was a faint image of a once calm and composed man crouched down with his hands held against his chest with blood arterially bleeding onto himself and him screaming at the top of his lungs. That was the weird part. I couldn't hear any of it. I ran to the door as his assistant chased him around the floor. I ran to the door and unlocked it and leaned over the balcony and yelled at the top of my lungs, Corman, Corman to the lab now. I turned around to the sight of his assistant on top of him, holding him down. His assistant had his arteries pinched under his armpits by using his hands to squeeze and was driving his knees into his hands. He had his ball spread out like a starfish on the back, on his back on the lab floor. I approached and was met by the hand that had been blown up to bits and looked like the human version of what happens to popcorn when it pops. The blood was still flowing at the rapid rate to the point where he was going to die if I did not give, get that blood faucet turned off in the 120 seconds allotted that I started with, but was already down about 37 seconds. I applied a tourniquet as tight as I could until the blood stopped. 
The next step was checking the rest of the body for trauma. I was doing great until I got to his face. There was shredded skin and flesh in his chest and all over his face. He was somehow now calm, but adrenaline had me hyper-focused enough to catch a bird midair at this point, because I realized I had to check inside of his mouth and review what was left of his eyes, seeing as he was eye level with the bomb device. By this point in time, there were people funneling into the room by pairs to see what had happened. The entire compound had heard this blast and thought either we were on an attack or a bomb went off, but well, they were right about one of those. They all stood there at a distance, watching us operate until the medical officer made his way into the room. I said, I have to check him out, man. Try to stay still as possible for me. I stuck my fingers in his mouth and to examine, noticed random pieces were just missing out of his mouth, but he was still able to breathe and talk. Next, I went for the eyes. Somehow, his protective glasses stayed completely intact and never left his face. So when I pulled them off, he looked me right in the eyes. He was put on a stretcher and taken down to the aid station in our compound while his assistant and I walked ourselves down there to stand outside the door. There was complete silence between us two. We had looked defeated. Shortly after getting awkwardly evaluated using the little bit of hearing capability we had at the time, I was called back up to the lab where I was met with a search party of at least eight individuals who had been tasked to look for, and I quote, the parts of him that blew off by the operations officer. The operations officer tasked me with writing up a short report of what happened that would be sent to the colonel who was our commanding officer. I stood there in hesitation, look at him, looking at him like he was crazy because not even 15 minutes ago, I had watched a man slash husband, father of two children get blown up by a bomb switch that even he believed was safe. I reminded myself that moment that I was in the military and at the end of the day, your command is only as good as his leadership. I thought to myself, damn, he really doesn't care, huh? Oh, well, I'll remember that for later. I belligerently replied with, Am I supposed to just ignore the presence of body parts on my screen as I type this, sir? I sat there typing the report, getting angry as it processed. I thought jumbled thoughts like, I came from my unit and was supposed to be in, a, in an advisor role, teaching the Afghans a skill. I hate being away from home. Why are my hands still shaking 20 minutes later? Did that really just happen? Am I going deaf? Man, this, man, this concussion headache is really kicking in. I wonder what piece of him is on my screen and how it's stuck there still. I thought we were pulling out of Afghanistan. On every other day in these past four months, they would just send me x-rays of whatever they're bringing me and then just dropped it off later. I'm still covering his blood. My right eye is still is starting to hurt. I would have lost my eyes if it were me because I don't wear safety goggles when taking these bomb switches apart. They're supposed to be safe. Wait, I've been here working for three days now because my civilian contractor partner and his boss flew off to take another bomb to another lab for a week. I realized suddenly that if the EOD, if EOD would have just dropped the bomb switch off like they have done the last 30 plus times, I would have been in there with both eyes missing, bleeding out through my left arm behind a locked door with only, with only 120 seconds for someone to find a way in and save me from death. For being saved from this, I am entirely grateful and able to type this report. I still do not understand, however, why did it blow up on him and not me? Even the tiniest deviation can dra dramatically change outcomes, sometimes benefit from seemingly random variations, and, also, and oftentimes you do not. That's it. Uh, just a couple of notes about it. Um, one, this is chopped down for obviously the assignments list was like four pages. Now it still was over a couple sentences, so I got deducted some points. Um, the typical military dude, as Trenton can probably attest to, is like super motivated and all that such. I'm not. Um, I'm just there to do a job because I'm good at it. And well, thank you for that. Uh, I'm just good at it, so I do it. And um, well, not anymore. I got out two months ago. And um, this specific city, it's called Lashkar Gah. And I found out, I want to say two or three days ago, that we, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the news, the Taliban left. I'm trying to pull up the little thing I had. Yeah, no. So since we left that city of Lashkar Gah, the Taliban took it over. So all the people I was working with, all the police there, they either dead or they ran away because the Taliban came in the second we left and started killing everybody. Um, the president blamed the country's fast deteriorating security situation on a sudden decision from the United States to withdraw. And that sudden decision to withdraw is actually about four days. We call it a 96 hour withdrawal, which means all the partnerships we have with these people for years and years, we end it within four days without telling them. 
because we tell them all the people embedded into the partner forces, which is really the person that ended up the one that was trying to kill us, me and the EOD guys, uh, were part like you know part of the Taliban. They're infiltrated, infiltrated. So um, yeah, it's pretty sad. And I found that out a couple of days ago. All those people I helped and was working with, uh, most of them are dead or they're chased out. So that's what we. That's that's just life. It's horrible. I, I, I think they, I mean, I'm not, obviously, I don't know anywhere near as much about it as you do, but I, I do know that they're trying to get more of the, um, I don't know what the official title is, but like the interpreters and the, you know, the, the civilians that yes. are assisting, they're trying to get more out, but, but we should have been moving on that for years. We should have been um, putting more money and more effort into that because they helped us. You know, you don't just leave people behind that that help you um i mean i think that that's a disgrace to our nation when we do things like that so um i, I do know that some of the, i do know the numbers have been increased and i do know that they've already started arriving um but we need to do a lot more <laughs> what you're doing marco by telling your story is balancing the space you're not okay. you're never bringing a mood down when you're sharing what's in your heart and your story, you're balancing the space. And that's where we have issues in our society. There's a lack of balance there. And, and the more you tell those stories, Marco, the more you'll find that even at TCC, many have had similar stories. I worked with the student leader who was the only one to survive. Um, uh, I think she was in Iraq and she was only 17 when she went in. Um, and, you know, many of these individuals that are here at TCC have PTSD. And so are you involved with the VSA, the Veteran Student Association? No, um, I kind of hide, stand alone, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie, I just kind of do my own thing. The PTSD thing, I kind of deal with on my own, like literally. Um, because ba just based on when I got home and... I stood there in front of his wife and his kids and they're just looking at me like that's the guy that saved our dad and i was just looking at i didn't say anything and then i just walked the other direction because in my eyes it was supposed to blow up on me because right that guy yeah. was trying to kill me and stop the lab from working because i was getting hit you see what i'm saying like mm -hmm. uh, it's just bad so i feel like i'm doing fine i have both my hands i can see you right now and he got the the terrible end of the stick so I kind of just like live through life that way. Yeah, well, you don't have to process this alone, but you're right about being discerning about who you share these stories with, because at the mm -hmm. end, you have to be mindful of your own process and your own healing, but definitely believe that you don't have to do that alone. Is there anyone else who would like to share? You know, we're only, what, 46, I mean, 15, 15, 16 minutes before the end of this event. So um, if you would like to share, um, as Professor Brash indicated at the start, you can also, you know, sing, dance, <laughs> screen share, an image. I know, I think me and uh, Professor Brash knows that Rachel has heart. Not to call it out, but I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I have my paper with me. Okay. You, you want you want to go, Trenton? Uh, I don't know how to share it. No, you read it. Just read it to us. You can just read it. Like, you don't have to share the, the text. You just read it out loud to us. Okay, it's not anything big. It's just, uh, it's about a, a fight that broke out when I was in Romania on New Year's. On New Year's Day. Uh, so the title is called One Midnight in Romania. And so it starts off, it was a cold, gentle, snowy night on the 31st of December in the year 2017, just before New Year's Day. I was detached from my original unit, which was with 1st Battalion, 10th Marines, and was deployed on a Black Sea rotational force with 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines. Both units were based out of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. We deployed to Mihail Koganisianu, Romania. It is about a three hour drive from Bucharest. 
The deployment was set to last nine months. I was a field radio operator working in coalition with Ford observers, joint fire observers, joint terminal attack controllers, and North Atlantic treaty organization forces such as Canada and Portugal. The night of New Year's Eve, all the Marines wanted to take it up a notch to bring in the new year. I was hanging out with two good friends of mine, Enver Divergic, who was an administrative clerk, and Jacob Cooper, who was a Ford observer. We started the night at this hangout spot called the White Tent. We had a few beers and were pretty much finished for the night. We were considered lightweights. We also needed to get back to the barracks for Wi-Fi, so we had enough time to call our family members back home. Midnight had approached and Enver and I were on our phones. I was FaceTiming my grandmother, Enver was FaceTiming his mother, and Jacob FaceTimed his family and his girlfriend. Jacob was in the room and Enver and I were sitting in the hallway of the barracks. A few minutes later, there was a poor excuse of Moraine, in my opinion, stumbling through the doors with a menacing look on his face. His name is Denzel Bunn. Everyone knew it was advised to him by superiors that he could not consume alcohol because he had a terrible drinking problem. As the type of person Denzel was, he got drunk anyway. Denzel approaches me and Ember during one of his drunken episodes, calls me a faggot and slaps my phone out of my hand while I'm in the middle of the conversation. Honestly, a part of me wanted to hit him with a sock lock, but I just ignored him, picked up my phone and continued talking to my grandmother. After the call was finished, we went into our rooms. We were still inebriated, so we started watching some YouTube videos to pass the time. About an hour goes by and a Marine comes in the room all bruised up. We asked him what happened and he told us that Bun had randomly started hitting him for no reason. So we brought him in the room and locked the door behind him. Some more time goes by and we hear a knock on the door. Everyone else in the room told me to ignore it, but I went to the door anyway. In a reluctant manner, I asked who was at the door. I heard a faint voice say Matthews. I opened the door and straight away walks in Denzel. You could smell the liquor on his breath still. I asked him what he wanted in a passive tone because I did not want him to think that I carried any aggression towards him. He started talking about his heritage as if anyone really cared, the hood he was from and the people he knew. He contacted his cousin over the phone to put a hit on us. Uh, we did not know if we could take him seriously because of the state that he was in. And he hung up the phone and jumped on top of Ember and hit him in the eye socket. So I got in his face. I jumped up, got in his face and asked him what the problem was more aggressively. And then Denzel asked me why I was selling pills to junior Marines. I never did do that. And before I realized it, he sucker punched me in the right part of my jaw. I went lights out and my head hit the floor like that. Minutes went by, which felt like three seconds to me. Uh, the next thing, I, next thing I remember is there's a corpsman handing me an ice bag. Uh, Marines are upset, screaming down the halls, looking for Denzel. And I'm in, I'm in the room being interrogated by the staff non-commissioned officer from the unit that was on duty that night. Later that morning, I was examined poorly by another Navy corpsman. He asked me if my head was hurting and if I felt like committing suicide. And he called that a traumatic brain injury test. I, report, <clears throat> I reported a statement to the Navy Criminal Investigation Services and CIS, and they did not even, they didn't even care. Uh, they just wanted to know if Marines were doing illicit drugs. Uh, I also told my mental health care provider at the Department of Veterans Affairs, and she did not care either. She just wanted to know if I smoked marijuana. And that's what I've been dealing with ever since. That was wow. The, the thing that I really, um, that I really like about that essay is that it really kind of captures the whole gamut of 
human personalities in one essay because you've got everything from like villains and heroes packed into one you know short like three page or so story mm. and that guy is such a villain i mean he's uh, there's probably a backstory to him as well because nobody's ever completely good or completely yeah, he evil. i had there was one night when um like we had a duty where we had to patrol through the night around the entire base on foot because we didn't have a vehicle. And um, he was telling me his story about like how he grew up and because I had told him I did pills and stuff. I'd never sold pills, but the same pills that I did, he knew a friend that had OD'd off of him, which is very common. So that's when he started telling me about his whole childhood and how he was raised and I guess that turned into why he developed that drinking problem. He had a really bad drinking problem because that wasn't the first time he ever fought somebody and, you know, said wild things like that, uh, either over the phone or out of his mouth, not on the phone. Mm -hmm. And like, I like your use of detail too, because a lot of times, I mean, we've been talking about this since the beginning of the semester with the, the Gates essay that um, Star was talking about, but the, the details that you choose to include. The fact that he did that, that he was getting verbally abusive and, and um, saying things, he, you're talking to your grandmother, you know? Like, dude, come on. Like, that is the worst, that's the worst thing about it. Like, you don't do that in front of somebody's grandmother. So yeah, I think that you, you have kind of a, a, a natural talent for picking out the details that are gonna add impact to the story. Appreciate that. Yeah, the authenticity um, exuded in all of the writing was really compelling. Um, and again, powerful in a way that empowers all of us, I believe, that um, have the privilege to hear it or to read it. Oh, Star's poem. Star, you got your poem? Yeah, I have it. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> um, this, is, this is not, it's not long. I promise it's not long. Um, it's kind of like a love one. Um, a lot of metaphor, um, and I wrote it, uh, I think 2016, I think I wrote it. Um, it is more of a deep connection that we seek, hit by the ocean breeze covered by sand, which only our toes and feet, my eyes don't lie on what they seen. Mother and father rush into the ER for the first arrival of their first born, torn between being nervous and ecstatic, also thinking that he had lost either, I would be tragic. But walk into the room to see his star and midnight moon brought to a running tear down his cheek, been waiting for this moment to be um, no more soon. A reality check hit a king to his queen and prince to never leave that side in the midst of night and day to stay compromised was dealt, is what I felt. A feeling in the pit of my stomach, my spine is a scale from one through 10 set to nine, like the feeling of being free after committing a crime. If only God can rewind, when I'm removing your glasses to see what was hiding behind, which was time. Two hearts clinging together as if magnets were the weakest force. Looking into the Statue of Liberty herself classified no torch. A companionship shared in the boat as, in the same boat as drowning and losing you was deeply feared. They can, came, they can come to me all they want, but what I want is the eyes I looked into. To follow the pedals passing to see the crowd, a secret between me and my soul that has never been told until now. The warmest that grew. You put your head down because you knew that nothing was capable of stopping me from loving you. Do you, though you live far, and your eyes is what I saw. Oh. I'm just telling you what I saw. Basically, me saying, um, child that love that a man sees without being born and a mother holding his child that's how I feel loved it it's really good thank you really good stuff good deep stuff oh though I do want to extend um gratitude to Professor Br Brash 
for um, accepting my invitation to work with her and to create this forum for your for the students. Um, our intent was to feature you, of course, the English 111, but also expand expand this space for the greater student body again to you know create this opportunity for building strength, to, for stretching yourselves, um, for um, building community and developing those transferable skills. Um, I am so grateful for the enthusiasm Dr. Uh, Professor Bresch offered me when I presented her with this idea, and I think that it turned out wonderfully. I, I'm thrilled with it. I think everybody did a fantastic job, and my only um, my only regret is that um, that everybody didn't read because everybody there were a lot of really really good essays in this class. I think that everybody had stuff that you know could have potentially been shared and appreciated. So I know some of you are, you know, more shy than others. So um, maybe, maybe next time, maybe in another semester, maybe with another teacher, you know, Alicia sets these up kind of on the regular for, for TCC. So if you hear about one coming up, you know her now. So like, hopefully you'll feel comfortable participating um, and, and getting your voice heard because you all have valuable things to say. And um, I don't want to waste any more time because I do also really appreciate Dr. Waters coming. And so I'm just going to yield the floor to her um, for her comments. Thank you for giving me the ideas. All of you, you're excellent. I mean, I was just floored by, you know, the authenticity of everyone. And you just don't know how beautiful you really are. And as I tell all my students, you are perfect just the way you are. Absolutely. Um, I'm dropping in the chat um, a video um, capture of a presentation that Dr. Waters gave on TED Talks, um, oh. vindicating your visceral voice, visualizing speeches story. Um, that is on our Virtual Student Center YouTube page. I dropped it in the chat so that you can view it and, and use it for your edification as well. Um, just really quickly. We uh, at TCC are I'm embarking on a new initiative to pre present student stories. So we will be accepting submissions in the vein of the moth. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the moth that's on NPR. Um, and so we are looking to name our series uh, with something that's meaningful to our community, but not so overtly TCC. Um, uh, because you are TCC and more. And so um, we, all, we have two, two suggestions. And so I want to get kind of poll you for the two suggestions that we have. And then if you don't like either, you can hit neither and then we'll continue um, polling the student body in various venues. But I have a poll that I'm gonna launch right now. And if you could just answer the poll. Um, this will be a feature that allows students to upload videos of them reading, reading a story or sharing a story into the Virtual Student Center Canvas shell. Um, and some of those stories will be encapsulated um, through our library and put into a capsule that will be opened up in some in the future. But these are again opportunities for you to share your personal stories. And each month we'll have a theme. And the first one will include pandemic stories, mm -hmm. just because students have gone through so much in the last year and a half. I also wanna um, just put out there that all students are members of Student Government Association. And oftentimes, again, you're not aware of that. So um, make time to kind of check out Student Government Association meetings so that you can share um, what you might need to have the experience that you would like to have here as a student or what might be impacting you or, you know, uh, just what kind of you, being a shared governance and creating the, the context and the culture here at the college. Um, and so more information about that is in the Virtual Student Center Canvas show. I really want to thank you, Alicia, because it was a fun mm -hmm. opportunity. And um, I always get a little bit sad at the end of the semester because I, you know, my students might not believe this, but I actually do miss them once they're, you know, once they move on. So um, it's nice to get to see everybody one last time. And um, so thank you very much for putting the, the legwork in to make this happen for, for us specifically this time, but also for TCC in general. Um, 
that you do on a regular basis. And also Star for, for being, you know, so gracious about um, stepping forward and, and being willing to take on the MC host, host you know, uh, position for us and, um, you know, doing your best to, to draw in your classmates and, and be supportive and, and be awesome. So thank you too. I um, uh, appreciate that. And I'm happy that they, some of them listen to me <laughs> and I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> and we got this extra credit, so let's go. <laughs> but it's, it was good to uh, hear from my, you know, my classmates to actually see that, you know, other stars were also in in this get together that we had today. And uh, Marco, I really, am, I really appreciate yours because that's really hard to share. Uh, Trenton, I, wish I was there with you, I would have, you know. <laughs> and Jada, um, really happy that, you know, the family united Elma, you know, the memories of your father. So it's really a good time to, you know, embrace um, our own feelings. And we all kind of know each other a little bit more. Um, if I see you um, in other classes, you know, holler at me <laughs> and uh, don't be a stranger. Uh, I kind of want to add Marco and Trenton and, you know, on Facebook, I get a chance. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was really nice, um, you know, getting to know you guys. It really was. Thank you for sharing this time with us. And I hope to see you soon. <laughs> we'll all meet. And uh, Alicia, I definitely want to get involved into... Uh, the writing yes come find me <laughs> okay good stuff all right everyone have a wonderful day bye guys bye. i'll be in touch by announcement soon